Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we have very much of a musical theme that will run right through the programme as we discuss the history of Israel's Philharmonic and how this was birthed out of the Holocaust and has become a gem in Israel's culture. Well, welcome to the programme and uh, today's guest is from uh, North London. Her name is uh, Ruth uh, Fisher. Uh, Ruth, uh, warm welcome to the Middle East Report. Thank you. Many thanks for having me. Pleasure. Now, this programme for you combines two of your passions, uh, mm. a passion for Israel and the, your passion for music as well. So you bring a whole new narrative uh, and story to our viewers, which is fabulous. But um, can you share with us um, something about your Jewish background and, and where you grew up and how that has influenced uh, the way that you see the world, particularly your love and passion for, for Israel? Yes, yeah, so um, I grew up in a, a Jewish family. Um, we had all the traditions at home and um, it was just an, a natural part of our lifestyle. Um, the, the part of Israel, I, I, I always remember any time that there was a, a, a program about Israel or they would be, they, we'd learn something about Israel. And we're, we're talking sort of in the late 60s, early 70s. I just always remember being really excited about Israel. There's, there's something that drew me there and I, I, I can't explain it, but I just felt an affinity. And um, when I was 17, 16, 17, I went as a volunteer. Um, no, my first visit was to Israel when I was 16, 17, and then I did do a year's volunteering in Shinat Shirut and just fell in love with the place. The minute I got off the plane, I just thought, I'm home. And <coughs> there is, excuse me, there is no other way to describe that feeling. And then two years after that, I made Aliyah and lived there for many, many years. And the music side of it comes from my mother's side. Um, she was herself a piano teacher, my grandfather was a violinist, and th there's always been music in the house, no matter what. And um, that has, uh, I was part of the Purcell School, one of the first pupils at the Purcell School of Music, um, many years ago. And it's just always been an, a part of my life. So I started off in classical, but also jazz was a, a very big part of my upbringing as well. My, one of my great uncles was a band leader in Wales, had his own band. Um, was mentioned on the BBC when he turned 105, I think it was. Um, so it's always been there, and I think it, it's uh, music and Judaism go together. It's always a part of our lives. So we sing on Shabbat, we will sing on Pesach, all our festivals. There's always something going on. So it just is, is such a natural part of my lifestyle that combines with my Judaism as well. Um, I mentioned that I'm getting married in six weeks' time. Congratulations, Five weeks. Mazel tov. Thank you. <laughs> and we're, we're having the theme of the, the, you know, the rabbi is going to be singing songs. It's, it's just such a part of our tradition. So um, I, I couldn't imagine my life being without being Jewish, but also without being without having music in my life as well. And uh, that that's where the, the passion for both. Fabulous. Um, and you're also a, a DJ as well, aren't you? So let our viewers know <laughs> that if, if you're a big jazz fan, please watch uh, Ruth on, on Jazz FM. You have to uh, stay up very late, though. I think uh, you've there got There is catch up. There so. is catch up. So <laughs> if, if they're awake in the night and they yeah. want to listen to some jazz from 1.30 to 3.30, is that on a Saturday uh, night? It's uh, 1 o'clock to 1 to 3 on a Saturday night, but there is catch up. Um, and I do feature a lot of Israeli jazz. Um, it's a fantastic scene over there. Um, and again, Monday nights between 9 and 10 p.m. Fantastic. So we're here to discuss the Israel yeah. Philharmonic, uh, which during the course of my research has become an absolutely kind of fascinating story because with the Israel Philharmonic, it's very much wound up with the history of Israel. Yeah. All the key integral events that occurred Israel Philharmonic is there with their incredible classic music, whether it's singing the Hatik Ver, bringing morale to the troops or mm. stirring the nation as a reminder of who they are. 
it is fabulous. So can you tell, give us, our viewers, uh, an introduction into the work of Israel Philharmonic? So, well, the, 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 the way that it started is, is very integral to even how the orchestra is today. Um, it came out of the ashes of the Europe, the Holocaust, um, and it's always been an orchestra of immigrants. But today, it's actually more or less an orchestra of young Israeli-born musicians. So it has gone from being an immigrant's orchestra to this incredible Israeli-only, Israel, no, it's not, sorry, I shouldn't say Israeli-only, it's I Israeli young musicians um, that make it who it is today, which is so relevant to, to Israel because I would say now that the majority of the population of Israel are people that have been born there, not, not necessarily the new immigrants coming in. Um, it's always been an integral part of the, the, the country. Um, again, it's music. People, Israelis love music and it's, it brings joy to so many people. So, for example, during the recent pandemic, um, people were desperate to hear music. And so they were able to go online and listen to the orchestra play, uh, you know, Tchaikovsky Symphony, the Pathetique, or, you know, it's just something beautiful that they could see. And they also, from the pandemic, had to learn how to, to reach out to new audiences and do it digitally as well, because obviously they came off stage. That was the first time in uh, 85 years, um, well, 70, no, 83 years that they've come off stage. There's, they've always been on stage. It doesn't matter which war, whatever's been happening in the country, they've always been playing. And this was the first time ever that the whole orchestra had to come off the stage. And it, it was a real, it was a real watershed moment, you know. Excellent. So how about this for an intro into the Israel Philharmonic, as uh, we see from this very powerful and very entertaining video. Don't know about you, but I found that absolutely fabulous, and I think that sums up everything that, that is Israel. Uh, and that's something I, I, I love so much about Israel, is the vibrancy, it, it's the culture, and one video that I think sums up Israel so well was that brilliant video produced by Israel Philharmonic, and, yeah. and the way it's done, and the style it's done, uh, to obviously to appeal to a younger audience as well. Yes, I, I mean, that's the point, with the new musical director, Lahav Shani, who is young, as you can see himself. I mean, yes, that's who we're reaching out to because the, the young, young people are our next audience, you know. Um, but yeah, you're right, it is all, I mean, I've watched that. I mean, I've watched it hundreds of times as it was being done and, and I still get a thrill from it, you know, it, and it is everything that Israel is. It's the, 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 the shuk in Shuka Carmel. It's, you know, it's just, it's perfect, I think. And I just think that sums up what Israel is. So, oh, ab absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and Ruth, can, can you tell us why Israel's Philharmonic is so, is, can only really be described as a jewel in Israel's cultural crown? Because culturally, Israel and the Jewish people um, um, excel at culture and excel in the arts and excel in music. Um, what makes them so special? I think at the moment, as I said, it's, uh, it's an orchestra that is um, of young Israeli-born musicians rising from the immigrants. But the, the whole history, the way that it's, it was founded, um, which is still very much an integral part of what the orchestra is today, but they 
they also give back to society and I think that's what makes it um, so it's a, it's a jewel in the crown. It feels like it's a family. So, and, and they're playing to their family and the audience are taking from their family. And, it, and I think that's just, I mean, aside from being incredible musicians, uh, my fiance is a musician himself and he said to me one time that he, he thinks they're one of the best orchestras in the world. He said they are so tight and their sound is just something that he, you don't hear with many orchestras. And I'm just wondering if it's the way that they have brought themselves together, that they consider themselves a family, but they're also part of the family of the whole of Israel. And, and, and I think that's their real key the key to why they are they are so different and so good you know it's not to take away from other orchestras <laughs> in the world obviously but it's it's a very different the, the whole history and the way that it was founded and the what it's turned into now is very different to a lot of other orchestras in the world and I, th I think that's the beauty of it. So if we take ourselves back to the 1930s almost coming up for, for 90 years ago this is where the Israel uh, Philharmonic was actually founded with the rise of Nazism, with the rise of fascism. Um, can you just explain the incredible history of the Israel Philharmonic uh, Orchestra and how it came out of the kind of darkest depths of Europe? Mm. Uh, and then they made Aliyah to Israel uh, and became the, uh, the, the Palestine Orchestra under the British mandate. Yeah, so it, I mean, it was down to this, the determination of one amazing man who was a Polish violinist, violinist called Bronislaw Hubisman, who could see the writing on the wall of what was happening to the, the Jewish community in Europe at the time. And a lot of the, um, he himself knew a lot of the musicians and they were getting fired from the orchestras, um, obviously before 39, you know, it started really 33. Um, and he persuaded a number of the musicians to go out to what was then Palestine. Um, and I, I can't imagine how they must have felt because they went, but at the same time they were having to leave loved ones behind. So it must have been a real wrench to actually go, but at the same time something very exciting that they'll be able to carry on with their music. So that was in 1936, and we are fast approaching um, the 85th anniversary. It's actually on December the 26th. Um, and that was the first concert that took place, um, conducted by um, uh, Arturo Toscanini, who himself was anti-fascist, who had stood up to both Hitler and Mussolini. And he, he came out and conducted the very first concert on December the 26th, 1936, and said, I'm doing this for humanity, which I think is such a powerful statement. And so that's how the orchestra began. It, it, it's just 70 odd musicians who came to the, as you said, sand dunes of Tel Aviv. You know, I, I, I can't imagine how they must have felt leaving these gorgeous concert halls in, in Vienna or Berlin or Paris and then coming to, to something that's relatively unknown and un, 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 unbuilt, you know. And, and starting afresh, but it was a determination of, of this one man, Bronislav Huberman, who just said, this is what we have to do. And he wanted to bring culture to the new homeland, you know. Uh, I mean, he rescued 75 of the mm. top musicians across, uh, across Central Europe, but also believed to be, have rescued over a thousand um, Jewish people for, mm. from the Holocaust. So, so really he did see, as you mentioned, he saw the writing on the wall. Mm. Uh, he had the hindsight to see that something very evil was going to fall across Europe and that the Jewish people had better get out. Uh, and so really, you can really describe him as, uh, I know he's Jewish, but almost like another Schindler, one of these uh, mm. incredibly brave and courageous individuals who saw what was going on and did all they could to, to rescue Jewish yeah. people yeah, as well. So indeed. that's also an important part of his legacy, is it not? Absolutely. It's his legacy. It's, it's the legacy of rescuing people from the ashes and uh, this, these terrible times. And also from his very first visit to Palestine, I, I think it was like 1926, something like that, um, where he obviously felt some sort of affinity with, with the land and um, decided that, you know, that there had to be culture, classical music 
in this area, and that's what he did. He was a very determined, determined gentleman. Uh, interesting story with him. You can see his personality is that he had a um, he was in an airplane accident, and he broke his wrist and two fingers, and had to teach himself to play the violin again. And he did. I mean, you know, somebody like that, you just know that they they've got this passion in them and this determination that they are going to do something and, and he did it. Excellent. So let's have a look at this inspirational video um, that tells the story of Israel Philharmonic. Dear friends, my name is Yoni Gertner and I'm a violist with the Israel Philharmonic. My grandparents, Fred Felick and Ruth Gertner, both Holocaust survivors, made Aliyah following the Second World War and settled in the city of Hadera. As you may know, the Israel Philharmonic was born out of a reality deeply rooted in the events that took place in Europe of the 1930s. In addition to the establishment of a world-class orchestra in Eretz Israel, the lives of the Jewish musicians who came here in 1936 were ultimately saved by this historic event. This year, we chose to present our special story the incredible feat of Bronislav Huberman, our founder, and some very personal and related stories of IPO members throughout the years. We will take you on a journey from 1936 to the present, beginning with a trailer from Josh Aronson's film, Orchestra of Exiles. Adolf Hitler came to power in January of 1933 and immediately began firing Jews from cultural institutions. Thousands of Jewish musicians found themselves out of work. Bronislav Huberman, the great violinist, did something few artists do. He stood up to tyranny, intolerance, and racism. Huberman had an inspiration that would change the cultural world. With Hitler firing the best musicians in Germany, it suddenly became clear to me that this was an extraordinary opportunity to give this wonderful audience in Palestine a first-class orchestra. This is when the Palestine Symphony began. He stepped out in front with all of his stardom and fame, used his music to organize something totally new, to show that the threat of Nazism would not destroy the cultural achievement of the Jewish people. Huberman was both a dreamer and a visionary. What he stood against took bravery. The Zionistic movement was really growing in those days, especially because of the rise of Nazism. Well, look at the situation in Central Europe and Germany in particular in 1935 and 1936. Nobody wanted his, his countrymen, his Jews. His solution was go to Palestine, find a new home. They came from Budapest, they'd been in Vienna, they'd been all over Europe. And here they get off the boat in Haifa, and I mean, there's nothing. <laughs> it's sand, a few buildings. Tel Aviv was really a desert before they came. I mean, can you imagine camels going on Fifth Avenue? I mean, that's how it felt. Then came the German Jews with suits and ties and funny hats, you know. Going to Palestine was no picnic. A lot of people described the heat and the bugs and the desert and the difficulty. It was a big deal coming to a land where the culture is almost non-existent, but everybody is very, very thirsty for it. They were so admired here that when they were walking, the bus stopped and gave them a lift. It created kind of a commune within the city. All the restaurants on the streets, the menu were in German. I think there was a lot of pain at what was happening in Europe and a lot of fear for loved ones that stayed behind. 73 musicians started the orchestra. 19 from Poland, 16 from Germany, 10 from Austria, four each from Hungary and Holland, and some were selected from among the local players in Palestine. 20 of these musicians had played first chair in their respective orchestras, and none expected to come to this desert outback only to come down in musical status. You are talking about the best players in Europe, you know, and Jewish people, don't forget that. So I know better than you, and he knows better than him, and etc., 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 and the fights, it's coming immediately. The most famous musician in the world, Arturo Toscanini's public refusal to conduct in Nazi Germany reflected his unbending resistance to fascism. He volunteered 
to conduct the opening concerts of this new Palestine Orchestra. And all over the world, it made a tremendous impression. The first concert was set for December 26th. Two months of rehearsals were to start November 1st under the baton of Maestro Steinberg. Torrential rains broke up rehearsals because of the terrible noise on the metal roof, and water dripped onto the musicians and their instruments. As things got worse in Europe, the musicians who were here, I think this pushed them harder. I think there was a sense of responsibility that they absolutely had to pass it forward. For the next 10 years, the Palestine Symphony toured throughout the Middle East. And they played for the Israeli troops during the 1948 War of Independence that ended with the world acknowledging the creation of the sovereign state of Israel. That day, the Palestine Symphony played Hatikva, the Hope, as the anthem of the state of Israel for the first time. And Ben-Gurion renamed Huberman's symphony the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. He plays one of the great orchestras of the world in one piece. Now that's something which we've never heard of and never been done again. By the time it was life or death. I don't know about you, but I was uh, really inspired by that excellent documentation on the history of Israel Philharmonic and how they played an integral role in the creation of the modern state of Israel. Uh, Ruth, you, you cannot but be inspired when, when you see that incredible video. Uh, and, and just the, the culture shock, I think, of many of these uh, East uh, European Jews making their way to uh, Tel Aviv and, and to, into the coffee shops, a completely different culture to what they were used to. But, but how much do you think um, Huberman deserves uh, huge amounts of credit and foresight for realizing there was no future for the, uh, the, the orchestras across uh, Germany and across Central Europe with the rise of Nazism, um, to say that there's an opportunity here to have an orchestra in the British Mandate uh, of Palestine. How much do you think this was motivated by Jew hatred and his foresight of what he saw was coming with Nazism, but also his kind of passion and love for the land of Israel, because this was the pre-state years? Yeah, I Israel. mean, yes, I, I mean, I, I would definitely say he was obviously a Zionist and from his first visits in the 20s, um, he obviously fell in love with the country and the land and, and felt a belonging. I mean, I don't know his story f from before where he was living, whether he'd experienced anti-Semitism and that was sort of a precursor for him becoming a Zionist. I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I, I think there was, I think it's a, a mixture of both. I think it was definitely the rising anti-Semitism that was starting in Europe, probably very quietly from after the First World War, um, you know, with all the, the, the issues, the economic issues that particularly Germany suffered from after, um, to also just feeling, okay, if we're, if, we're, if we're going to go to Israel, if I'm going to make Aliyah, and we need culture, and so we have to bring music and culture to this new land. And, and so I think for him, it was an element of getting away from the anti-Semitism, no doubt. I mean, to be honest, the only place that we really are safe is in, in Israel. Well, that, that's my own personal opinion, I do believe that. Um, so I, I think it was an element of that, but also the fact that because he had to start somewhere new, to bring something beautiful into this new fledgling country, that needed culture because as, as, as you just heard on the on the the documentary there there was nothing <laughs> you know there was sand there were camels as somebody said well can you imagine camels walking down fifth avenue could we imagine them walking down oxford circus you know crazy and there it is you know I, I, i'm talking about that the the adjustment that the musicians would have had to make i mean you know used to playing in berlin or used to playing in in Hungary, in Budapest, or playing in Vienna, or playing mm. in Paris, 
and then finding themselves in the kind of desert Imagine. pre-state years of, of the modern state of Israel, which was controlled by the British under the British mandate, um, would have been a very, very big transition for them to, to, to make. But of course, it proved correct. And this was the yeah. birth of Israel's Philharmonic. Um, how do you think the influences of the Second World War, the Holocaust, has played a major role, not only in the identity of the Israel Philharmonic, but, but also um, goes to the very core of who they are in terms of their music and how they produce their music and their identity is knowing that it's actually come out of, of, of Nazi Europe. Yeah, I, I mean, I think fr from the beginning, I would say that, it, you know, it, that's who they were. They were an orchestra that was born out of the ashes of Europe. Um, I would say it's very much of who they were, but I think now the, the orchestra has developed into this young, energetic orchestra with this new wonderful musical director, Lahav Shani. I think they remember the history, but they're moving on to the next stepping stone now and, and they're branching out. But you, you can never get away from that history. I mean, you know, the, these, the guys that started it, Huberman, and then those musicians that came, you, you can never get away from that. But they were, they were our founders of the orchestra. You know. Pioneers as well. The pioneers. Definitely. And they must have been exciting as well for them. I mean, we say, we, you know, they, they came from Budapest, wherever, Paris, Berlin, Vienna. Um, but at the same time, they were, they, they'd come over and they were playing music. And whatever any musician will tell you, for them, the most important thing is to be able to pick up their instruments and play, and especially in an orchestra, because you, are, you really are a team. Um, so th it must have been, you know, an amazing combination of feelings of grief, uh, bewilderment and excitement and relief. Also relief. Absolutely. So, so tell us about the first concert uh, that the uh, Palestine Orchestra played, as you said, in Tel Aviv on the 26th of uh, December 1936. And, and was this a kind of victory over, over Nazism, primarily because here they are, they had reassembled in the British mandate of Palestine. They fled the rise of Jew hatred that we saw across the continent, particularly with, with Germany, uh, and now they had their first concert, and I think we saw in that video as well, conditions were not exactly easy with the <laughs> torrential rain falling on the tin roof and, yeah. and many of the musicians having to have umbrellas. It's not something you think of when you think of Israel and Tel Aviv. No, but can you just imagine how they must have felt playing in freedom? So it doesn't matter if there was rain. It doesn't matter if there was the, the loud rain on the corrugated iron. I mean, I mean, that's Israel anyway. It's just the fact that they were playing this concert and that they had one of the greatest conductors in the country coming over and conducting them and then saying, I'm doing this for humanity. I mean, you, you can't get a more powerful statement than that. And Ruth, um, share with us the role that the great scientist himself, um, uh, sorry for leading scientist Albert Einstein, for example, he was also asked to be the first president of the state of Israel, was also mm. instrumental in helping to establish the uh, orchestra of, of Palestine then? Yes, so, so interestingly, Huberman and Einstein were great friends because Einstein himself was a passionate violinist. And I don't think many people know that about him, but he was. And they used to get together and they would discuss scores and how things should sound. Um, so there was this real connection. And then in um, 1951, he, w he led the, the orchestra with their first fundraising trip when they were... Um, went to America to tour, and um, he 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 wrote this beautiful welcome note to them. Um, if, if I'm allowed to read it, because I course, think it absolutely. really is yeah, go for wonderful. It. Go for it. He, sa he wrote, um, the fond hopes that all of us have for Israel are beautifully symbolized in the IPO. Israel's significance has always been to create and embody intellectual and spiritual values. In this sense, every Jew may look upon Israel as his country, in whose efforts and achievements he takes part, or at least should take part. And in this sense, I am greeting this orchestra as our orchestra. May it prosper and find the response it so well deserves. I mean, that's just, just it, it gives me tingles when I read that. It's, but so he was so much a part of the orchestra. Um, and 
you know, can you have, imagine Einstein, somebody coming, he, you, you have, uh, you're at a party and Einstein comes up to you and says, you know, you need to donate to the orchestra. I mean, fantastic. I wish I could do that. <laughs> and also I think people don't understand his, his real Zionist credentials because mm. he played a, a major role in helping to re-establish the modern state of Israel. He was even asked by David Ben-Gurion to be Israel's president. first president, for example, which he declined, but he became the the uh, patron of um, mm. the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Mount Scopus as well. So uh, I'm learning something new every day. So I'm learning that he, he was also a violinist um, yeah. into his music. So here's another story that I think the world needs, needs to know. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and Ruth, coming on to the uh, 1940s, because the 1940s was an incredible decade, not only for, for Israel, but also for the Israel uh, Philharmonic, as we saw that uh, the Second World War came to an end in uh, 1945. Only three years later, the uh, modern state of Israel was reborn on the 14th of May 1948 in Tel Aviv and uh, at the uh, David Ben-Gurion's um, Declaration of Independence, the Israeli Israel Philharmonic played the Hit Tikva. Now that must have been an incredibly moving moment as yeah. Ben-Gurion declared Israel's independence and the orchestra just sung the, the new anthem of the State of Israel, the Hatikva. How moving would that be? I mean, yes. I mean, you, you just listen to Hatikva. I, 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 it's one of the most powerful musical anthems that you have because in, in every note you can feel the yearning to be in Israel, in our, in our own land, free in our own land. So can you imagine, Ben Gurion says, this is Israel, we're here. And then to hear those first stirring notes and you're singing your own national anthem. I mean, it must have just been phenomenal. I would love to have been there, <laughs> I must admit. Um, born too late for that. But yeah, I, I don't think there could be, anybody listening would have been just bowled over. Goosebumps. Yeah. So I called to my notes here, which was also interesting, that on the 20th of November 1948, a few days after Israel's liberation, the IPO performed a moving concert uh, on the dunes of Beersheba um, and also says they were remembering the young uh, Leonard Bernstein uh, mm. playing and conducting the orchestra before 5,000 soldiers who fought in Israel's war of independence. And knowing that, that the soldiers who fought for Israel war of independence were also so many of them were holocaust survivors mm. themselves others have fought alongside the british and americans in the second world war and here they are fighting for israel's independence as a jewish state how much do you think the the orchestra would have really boosted the morale of the soldiers and of the nation as they were surrounded by five arab armies and and it's israel's most costliest war a war of independence yeah, absolutely um yes again as I, I, th I think it's this thing about music that just brings people together and also it brings a refuge because you can actually, for however long a piece of music is, you can just lose yourself in it. So you have somebody like Leonard Bernstein, this young conductor, up and coming conductor, who travels thousands of miles to be with, with the Israelis and with the soldiers conducting, um, must just have brought some sort of relief to the, the soldiers that for, for a few minutes or an hour or however long the concert was that they could just lose themselves and, and not think about the guns and the war. Um, and interestingly enough, this concert, um, Alex, um, Leonard Bernstein's son Alex uh, Alexander said um, more recently that actually that concert was the start of a very long love affair with the IPO which stayed with uh, until Bernstein died in 1990. So, you know, there was that connection right from that minute, that, that year, 1948, to when he died. There was just this connection. And I, I think that says a lot. I, mean, I, I know Israelis always, when, when somebody will go out there when they're at, at their lowest, you know, they're in another conflict and you have the foreign tourists coming out and showing support, they love it. They really feel that there's, you know, that people actually care, and and that's so important. And I think that probably would have been the same feeling that the soldiers in 1948, who, as you said, many were Holocaust survivors, who'd gone through that, and then were now having to deal with this. And it, it was it's another case of life and death. And then you can have some beauty, 
in the sand dunes of Beersheba. You Absolutely. Know. But also what I think is extraordinary with the, um, the IPO and that generation of uh, musicians in Israel during Israel's War of Independence is that they showed bravery and courage by actually being in armoured vehicles, driving up oh, to yeah. Jerusalem during the siege of Jerusalem, in which the Jordanian um, army tried to strangle Jerusalem um, so that the Jewish communities there would actually surrender and the Jordanians would take control, uh, and actually then risk their own lives to go to Jerusalem to play for the Israeli soldiers then, mm -hmm. and also for the re Jewish residents of Jerusalem yeah, to yes. say that you're not alone. Um, that must have brought an incredible sense of morale and joy and relief to those that were caught up in the siege of Jerusalem during Israel's War of Independence. Yeah, I mean, as, you know, yes, absolutely, because, again, you, you can lose yourself in the music for, a, for an hour or however long a piece of music is. And, and, and I think only music can do that. Music has no boundaries. It, it has no walls. And... And I think that that is why, for, for, for a lot of musicians, it's, it's not just that it's their profession. It's actually something that they feel inside themselves. And they, they have to play and they have to give to others. And, and I think if you just look at the recent pandemic, what were we doing when we were stuck at home? We were listening to music and we were reading books and we were watching movies. Everything. That's great now, doesn't it? <laughs> Yes, can we go back? No, we don't want to go back. But, um, you know, it, it, that's how important arts and culture and music is. It does. It brings people together. It's Absolutely. So, so, so many of our viewers, so many of, the, of you have been to Jerusalem and you would have been on the highway from Tel Aviv to yeah. Jerusalem, going up to Jerusalem and seeing the armoured vehicles that were on the roadside. And they are a monument to yeah. um, the siege that uh, the Israeli forces were able to break to give those mm. urgent food supplies to the residents of, of Jerusalem. And so now when I see those armoured vehicles on the road, I'll think of the uh, Israel as, as well, as yes. well going up on that Absolutely. siege as well, which is fabulous. Um, but also, can you share with us one of the most moving and powerful concerts that uh, the Israel Philharmonic ever played? And that was at Mount Scopus, just less than a month after the liberation of Jerusalem during yeah. the Six Day War. I mean, yes, again, a monumental time because Jerusalem had been divided for so long and for Jews, obviously, it's very important that Israel remains undivided. Um, so, and I don't know, you've probably been to Mount Scopus with that amphitheatre and you have this incredible backdrop of the, of the desert behind you, the Judean desert. I mean, it's phenomenal. Could you imagine having a concert there with Leonard Bernstein and also the young Isaac Stern? I mean, phenomenal. So again, and I think all the heads of states were there because it was a big thing. You know, Israel, uh, Jerusalem was not divided anymore. And, and that's a really powerful, powerful moment in that history. And again, the IPO were there. And, and it's interesting that um, Isaac Stern was there because he was also... Um, 30 odd years later, at that very famous concert at Binyan Ehulmah during the first Gulf War. Um, and I was there, one of the ones in the audience, and all of a sudden the sirens went on and we just reached down for our gas masks. And uh, they went off stage, and then all of a sudden you saw Isaac Stern come out, no gas mask, and he gets his violin and he plays Bach Chacon, and you just think, gosh. I mean, him to stand out there looking at a whole f row of faces with their gas masks on, playing this beautiful music. And, and again, that's the power of music. And, and that he would also be there, because he was obviously American, but the connection that he felt with the orchestra, it's just, it's unbreakable. So let's have a look and uh, watch this uh, beautiful piece of music played by the Israel Philharmonic. <laughs>
And uh, if you want to see more inspirational music, then I definitely recommend going on to the Israel Philharmonic YouTube page, uh, where they've got uh, so many videos for you to watch and to listen, which is fabulous. Uh, I've got to tell the uh, incredible story. I mean, there are so many more historical incidents, particularly going back to 1973, uh, Yom Kippur War, when the Israel Philharmonic toured Israel to bring morale and comfort to the Israeli soldiers fighting against the Syrian and the Egyptian forces in the 73 war. But, but also I think what was so moving was in 1971 when the Israel Philharmonic uh, decided to play in Berlin. Uh, and, and let's remember this was still in the Cold War, this was controlled by the Soviet Union, uh, and also the horrible memories uh, of the Holocaust were only something like 30 years prior to that. Um, how moving and powerful was it to have a concert only 500 metres away from the German Reichstag, uh, where all the horrendous atrocities against the Jewish people across Europe began, and to actually then play the Hatik for the Israeli national anthem on German soil um, must have brought healing, but also showed an incredible victory over Nazism. Yeah, I mean, it, this is actually one of my, my favourite memories of, of all knowledge of the, the, the orchestra, in that they did go to Berlin. I mean, could you imagine going back as an Israeli orchestra? But yes, that was an, another defeat of Nazism. But they, they went with Zubin and we just saw that incredible uh, uh, film of, of Zubin playing, I th it was a Mahler symphony. Um, he's been with the orchestra, he started in 1961, and he, any time there was any conflict to it in Israel, he would get, he would cancel his engagements wherever he was, and he would get to Israel. That's how passionate he was wow. about the orchestra. And when he went to Berlin with them, the, the, the audience went wild for the, or, the orchestra and it was encore after encore after encore and they just couldn't let them off the stage. And apparently Zubin turned around, the story is that Zubin turned around to the then leader of the orchestra, Chaim Taub, and said, we're going to play Hatikva. Now Chaim was like, oh, I don't know, it's, you know, maybe it's not, it's not on the program, da da da. And Zubin just said, we're playing it. And they did. And, um, Apparently, one by one, in the audience, they just stood up one by one because they felt something that was really powerful in the music, knew something was going on, but they didn't know what it was because it wasn't in the programme. And apparently, Taub said it was one of the most moving moments in his life, so much so that he was crying so hard that his violin was wet with his tears. And, and I just... Can you imagine what that must have, that feeling of playing your national anthem, Hatikva, in the place 500 metres from, as you said, awful atrocities were committed against our people, you know, it, it's just phenomenal. But, and I think also possibly it was a, a healing moment for the, the, the non-Jewish audience um, to, to sort of acknowledge that they knew what was going on. Well, we, they, know, they know the history of that area, um, but at the same time, standing for the new Israel's, you know, the, their, their national anthem, I just think is, it, it brought a healing to them as well. Fabulous. It's a great story. Uh, and also, kind of bringing up today, can you tell us a little bit more about the new uh, conductor, uh, uh, oh. Lahav uh, Shani? Lahav Shani, yes. Oh, Lahav Shani, sorry. He's, <laughs> he's really one of the most exciting musicians. I mean, he's, he's brilliant. He's a, a pianist, uh, a bassist, as well as a conductor. Um, and he just embodies the future of, of uh, the Israeli, the, the, the orchestra. Um, he's been associated with the, um, <coughs> excuse me, he's been associated with the orchestra since he was a, a youth. He was in the youth concert. And even in 2007, he performed under the baton of Zubin Mehta and then some years later, he then takes over from Zubin. Um, he, he brings a different dynamic to the orchestra. As, 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 as I mentioned at the start of the interview, it's a very young orchestra now. He's young, and so he's sort of really uh, relating to the, 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 the members of the orchestra, but also, I think, to the young people who are coming to the concerts now. And he's, he's still um, adhering to the traditional 
you know, repertoire, but he's also bringing in some contemporary works, which is very exciting. And there's also, because he's very uh, much into chamber music and he's very involved in it, so he's bringing that into the programme as well. So there's a chamber music series uh, as well. Um, yeah, he's really exciting and it's just such a shame that when he was supposed to take over and it was this historic moment that you have a young person taking over from Zubin, the world shut down with, with COVID-19. So really now the start of this season, the 85th season, is really the moment where we're really going to see La Havre um, and the orchestra and, and the, how it's going forward, the future of it. Absolutely. Very exciting. So we'll, we'll finish the programme with La Havre. So not quite at the oh, end sorry. of the programme yet, Ruth, but <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show our viewers right at the end of the programme uh, how good La Havre is. Yeah. Um, but also, I mean, what does this mean for Israel? Um, essentially to have a world-class orchestra uh, based in, in Tel Aviv. Uh, and it's a fantastic way of bringing in people that love music, who love classical music, that bypasses the media portrayal of Israel in, in, in uh, the conflict. It bypasses the whole BDS movement uh, and just really shows the beauty and the richness of Israeli culture and its diversity as well. Yeah, I, th I think the first um, and foremost, the, the orchestra is very well aware of, of the image and, and the difficulties that they have when they go overseas. I mean, we only have to remember just a few years ago at the Royal Albert Hall. Um, but they, rem they know that they are Israel's ambassadors to show the, the, the really good side of Israel and, and what they're good at, you know. And it is the arts and the cultures. It's so many other things, but I'm just, we're talking about the orchestra. Um, so, and, and I think also the fact that the orchestra br builds bridges and it tears down barriers. As I said, music has no barriers. So, you know, they, they could, they've been to China, you know, and they've performed there. China also has, human rights issues um, you know so that any musician will generally rise above the politics and it's about showing the the, the, the music to the people that want to hear it um, so I, you know it, it's hard for them it must be very hard for them and it's hard for them they, they probably don't can't none of us can figure out why somebody would want to disrupt a concert but at the same time they for them it is to bring the culture to it, it they bring israel to the world through their music and 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 they will always do that they will continue to do that i'm sure absolutely um so ruth for, for the viewers watching who've been inspired by this program today that have a passion for music um, particularly classical music as well um how can they get involved and support the uh, incredible work being carried out by israel philharmonic Yes, so um, we have, uh, you can see the, at the bottom of the screen, you've got our website. You can go onto there and you can see the sort of programs that we are doing. Um, it's been a very, very difficult year for the orchestra, 18 months, I would say. Um, we lost uh, a season and a half of concert subscriptions. Um, it's picking up, but it's not quite the same as it was. Um, so, you know, you can donate online. Uh, we have quite a few projects. We have an emergency fund that you can um, donate to. We, uh, we have gift aid as well. Um, and also at the same time, just sign up to get on Oh, just sign up to get our newsletters um, and you'll have information about the concerts. I should actually mention that we have um, our gala on the 26th of uh, December, Boxing Day. Um, if you go onto the website, the IPO website, you'll, you can get all the information and you can sign up to get the link. Um, and also, if you happen to be in Tel Aviv on the 19th of December, they're doing a special um, concert at the Hilton in Tel Aviv with the theme of Frank Sinatra. Fabulous. So if you want to go, it's an open event. Just go and... and uh, Ruth, I just want to thank you so much for being my special guest on the Middle East Report. Pleasure. And thank you for bringing alive uh, Israel's music, particularly being carried out by Israel Philharmonic. And I want to thank you for watching this program today. Yes, there's been an incredible musical theme to this program because the Israel Philharmonic has been intertwined with Israeli history and has played a major role in supporting the Jewish state during key 
moments in Israel's history. So we're going to leave you with the Israel Philharmonic playing the powerful Hatikva as an inspiration to you all to stand with Israel and the Jewish people.